Hi, everyone. Welcome to the May edition of the Westwatch webinar. And we're really excited to have a special session today that's focused on One Health. And we'll tell you about that in a second. But first, what is Westwatch? Uh, Westwatch is a monthly webinar series that brings together NOAA staff and our partners from across the region to share information about climate observation and impacts across the West. And we have two different formats. Uh, this month is, is the format where we focus on a specific topic. And then every other month, we do kind of a more general uh, climate overview. And if you miss any months, our videos are posted at that noaa.gov slash Westwatch site. So please check it out. I'd like to actually kick things to my colleague, Morgan Zabow, who will talk a little bit about the One Health program at NOAA. Thanks so much, Joe. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. My name is Morgan Zabo, and I work in NOAA's Climate Program Office and help to coordinate NOAA's One Health Program. So before we get started with our presentations today, I wanted to give you all a background about One Health and the upcoming One Health Summit. So One Health applies a collaborative, multidisciplinary, and cross-sector approach to addressing potential or existing risks at the interface of humans, animals, plants, and ecosystems. The One Health concept recognizes that the health of humans is extricably linked with the health of aquatic organisms, plants, and the environment. And the work within One Health creates conditions for economic vitality and growth and supports scientifically sound, environmentally sustainable, and just practices and policies. So the NOAA One Health team is hosting the first NOAA One Health Summit in Washington, D.C. from August 15th through 16th this year. The NOAA One Health Summit in August will bring together scientists and practitioners across the agency to connect and highlight NOAA's work on health and related issues with the health sector that supports the One Health approach. We're accepting abstracts to part participate in the summit through June 12th, and I'll put the link to that in the chat momentarily. And so in preparation for the One Health Summit, we're hosting this webinar series to highlight a single aspect of health work being done in eight NOAA regions. Today's webinar is the first region in that series and focuses on climate-induced ecological health shifts in the Western region. And while we're highlighting this aspect of health work in the West, please be aware that there are examples of almost every One Health thematic area in every region around the country. And we hope that you can join us for webinars in the series between now and July. And of course, we hope that you can join us for the One Health Summit, either in person or in DC virtually. And with that, I'll kick it back to Joe. Thank you, Morgan. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, very briefly our speakers. Uh, first, we'll have Karen Holcomb, who's a biologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Fort Collins, Colorado. And she'll be talking about her work on vector-borne disease. Uh, then we have Morgan Gorris, staff scientist at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, and she'll be talking about some of her work on valley fever. Uh, and then kind of in a combo presentation, we have Joe Krieger, who's the Invasive Species Coordinator at the Great, uh, Great Lakes uh, Environmental Research Lab, which is uh, part of NOAA's OAR. Um, and he'll introduce a bit about the Invasives program. And then Sean McDonald, his colleague at University of Washington and Washington Sea Grant, will be talking specifically about green crab in the Pacific Northwest, which are invasive species. Just a quick bit of housekeeping. I got a quick poll question I'm gonna launch in a second. Um, but before we get to that, each speaker or each kind of speaking slot is about 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, if you have questions anytime during the webinar, please enter them into the questions box. Uh, we'll try to do a little bit of Q&A after each speaker and hopefully have some time at the end for the whole group. This session will be recorded. And so you can take a look at this later or share with other colleagues that may have missed this. And you'll also receive a post webinar survey. And we really appreciate your feedback for ideas for us to do future webinars as well as your experience here. So with that, I'm going to launch this quick poll. Hopefully you're seeing that on your screen. Just have you attended Westwatch before? Great, and it looks like, I'm not sure if it will let me show this, but uh, it was 73% uh, um, of the folks that are our new attendees. So welcome, we're really excited to have you. Um, let's go back to slideshow. 
And I think that does it for me. So if you have any questions about the, the Westwatch series uh, or this webinar, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm Joe Casola. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Karen and have her begin her presentation. There we go. Hopefully control is yours. Okay, and hopefully I am actually showing the correct screen now. Check. Yep, looks great. Looks great, great, thank you. I do not understand go to webinar, so thank you for the thumbs up. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Karen Holcomb, and as was mentioned, I am with the Centers for Disease Control here in Fort Collins. And I'm in the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases, and I'm happy to get us started by doing a whirlwind tour of linkages between weather and climate and vector-borne diseases. Find the correct screen. Um, to do this, I'm going to go through three different vector-borne diseases. I'm going to show you three different levels at which weather and climate can impact it. So we're going to start with West Nile virus and mosquito-borne disease and look at how weather and climate impact the vector themselves and then move on to plague and look at more of ecosystem, ecosystem level approaches and then wrapping up with Lyme disease where we can take an environmental, social and climactic context to understand. So to start off with West Nile virus is the leading cause of mosquito-borne illness in the United States. It's transmitted by Culex mosquitoes. Their pictures are up there at the top of the corner. And it's maintained between birds and mosquitoes and can spill over to cause disease in both horses and humans. And the most severe form of the disease in humans happens when the virus goes into the central nervous system. And if we look at spatial distributions of where West Nile virus is reported each year, there's the highest annual incidence along those Great Plains states, as well as across the West and a little bit of the Mississippi River Delta area. But West Nile virus is endemic across the United States. So we're going to start off with how does weather and climate impact mosquitoes in the viral dynamics? And I'm going to walk you through a logic model to be able to identify some of these relationships, focusing on that these are nonlinear and multifaceted. So if we first look at temperature, as we increase temperature, this can increase the developmental rate for the mosquitoes. So mosquitoes are developing faster, so we get more mosquitoes around. However, if it gets too hot, mosquitoes start dying faster. So we're having reductions in mosquito abundance. And we can, uh, temperature also impacts infection prevalence by shorter periods of time when a mosquito can pick up a virus to when it can transmit it. This is called the extrinsic incubation period. And this is shorter as temperature increases. Mosquitoes are also biting faster. So we're getting more transmission potential opportunities of viral transmission at warmer temperatures. So when we combine those impacts of temperature on both abundance and infection prevalence and rates of biting, we can see nonlinear trends. As we increase temperature, we increase originally transmission rates, but then that plateaus and drops off very rapidly due to it getting too hot essentially for the mosquitoes. So when we look at precipitation, we can also see these nonlinear impacts where increased precipitation can produce more breeding sites. So we have more locations where mosquitoes can breed in standing puddles around uh, storm drains and the like. But if we get too much precipitation too fast, this has been shown to wash out these standing water locations. So it removes those mosquitoes that are developing in those sites. So we can increase and decrease populations with precipitation. And as you'd expect, freezing temperatures over the winter, increase mortality in our mosquitoes that are trying to maintain over the winter. Therefore, we reduce the number that are there present at the beginning of the season. And when it comes to drought, we have more nonlinear impacts where drought can first remove predators for those mosquitoes and release the populations to larger. However, drought is also removing the standing water from around. So therefore, we're reducing breeding sites and reducing the potential for mosquito abundance. Drought has also been linked to increases in mosquito infection prevalence, paradoxically somewhat, 
is we're having um, more birds and mosquitoes congregating at the few water supplies that are present around the drying landscape. So we're able to transmit West Nile virus between the birds and mosquitoes and shorter time frames and amplify it to higher levels. So I've shown you very nonlinear impacts of temperature, precipitation, other climactic factors, but this just focused on the mosquitoes and the viral dynamic themselves. The birds, the hosts of West Nile virus, likely are also impacted by climate as well, but they're not included in this sort of a level of a logic model. So let's move on to our next vignette. I'm going to walk through plague, where we'll incorporate more of the hosts and ecosystems. So plague is a flea-borne disease, the bacterial flea-borne disease, and it's maintained between fleas and rodents, like ground squirrels and chipmunks, in humans and domestic animals can become exposed to these fleas which have hopped off their uh, rodent hosts who have died from plague so they can transmit the plague bacteria from the rodents to us and the bacteria then can get into various different parts of us first our lymphatic system causing swollen lymph nodes like bu bubos so this comes for bu bubonic plague Bacteria can also disseminate throughout the blood system, encephalitis plague, and then very deadly get into the lungs, pneumonic plague. So plague is a highly uh, high mortality disease if uh, appropriate antibiotics are not given. The majority of cases have been reported in the Western United States with a hot spot around the Four Corners region. So if we look at the logic model for this disease, we're gonna, I call this the trophic cascade hypothesis of plague transmission. So it takes into account the impact of climate on the vectors, hosts, and overall. So as we increase precipitation, it's been shown that this increases soil moisture and is more hospitable to those flea vectors. And I'll note that this is a nonlinear relationship again, where too much moisture is a bad thing. Uh, moisture also increases the ecosystem production of food resources. So we're able to have an explosion in those wild mammal populations, which hosts those different fleas. So we're having increasing amounts of plague infected fleas across the United, across the landscape, which can in cause increased transmission to domestic animals and to humans as well. So this, uh, hypothesis was originally proposed back in the 1990s and it seemed to fit with the data that was available at that time. However, 25 years later, we need to reevaluate this relationship to see if it still holds and if there are other factors that might be influencing exposure to humans, including socio-demographic factors, behavioral factors, are people, where are people in the environment in relationship to these hosts and environments and how does climate impact this? So to answer some of these questions, I'm gonna land us here in Lyme disease. So this is a tick-borne disease spread by Exodes ticks. And these ticks have multi-year multi life cycles. And during specific parts of the year, the ticks are active looking for hosts they generally use small, mode, small mammals and rodents as well as deer for hosts, and humans can also be exposed to these ticks. Shortly after a tick bite with, that is infected, some symptoms include fever, chill, headache, nausea, vomiting, headache sorts of things, and a subset of people who are infected get the bullseye rash, which is called erythema migrans. And there is a whole host of later signs and symptoms that can develop days to months after tick bite. There is effective antibiotics to um, prevent and cure less, uh, Lyme disease. So I'm gonna take this vignette in a slightly different approach. We're gonna build from the bottom up to the ecosystem. So let's look at what are weather factors that impact ticks. Both low and high temperatures increase tick mortality rates. So we have more of those nonlinear relationships with climate, as well as increased, temp increased humidity may increase the tick's ability to tolerate those high temperatures. So additional modulation multifaceted aspects of climate. And it's this temperature and humidity combination that's influencing the timing of which ticks are active in the environment and may bite a person. 
And it's not just, as we've seen, ticks are not in isolation in the environment. They have varying different hosts of rodents and deers. So the landscape and community composition also impact the abundance of our ticks and the infection prevalence. And climate can be impacting these distributions of hosts as well as landscape types seen across. So let's take a step back and look at nationally. Between 1991 to 2020, this was warmer and wetter on average. I'm gonna draw your attention to the Eastern United States over here. So given everything that I've told you thus far, you'd assume that warmer and wetter would be better for ticks. So we might be getting more ticks, we might be getting more Lyme disease cases. So let's look at where there have been reported established populations for these Ixodes ticks. Between 1996 and 2021, we did see changes in the distributions. So I want to note that um, tick surveillance is not done systematically, and some of these changes are just due to us looking for ticks in the areas where they were already existing. And the expansion of the Ixodes scapularis ticks, so those in the eastern United States, have been associated with multiple changes, changing distributions of the deer, their hosts, the forested regions, as well as the addition of um, surveillance and then chicks just spreading throughout climatically suitable regions, which is that shaded yellow area that you, we're showing in these different plots. So now if we look at where Lyme disease cases have been reported over time, we see that there have been changes in reported distributions, but these do not necessarily mirror exactly the changes in tick distributions, nor follow exactly the warmer and wetter conditions that are showing for climate. So it's a very interrelated, multiple factors interrelated inter to each other. And some of the ones that I wanna highlight that have changed between time periods, and these are not necessarily causal changes, but things that have been changed, which may result in different distributions. Case reporting has uh, increased for, pop for Lyme disease cases. There've been changes in definitions of what Lyme disease cases qualify as the changes in distribution of tick pathogens, human behavior in the outdoors, are they using um, repellents? Where are they going? Are they living more in rural areas or urban areas? Changes and in increases in deer populations and distributions, land use changes, forested regions, sorts of things, as well as the background warmer and wetter conditions that we are seeing on average. But no single one of these factors is um, solely responsible or able or predictive of where Lyme disease cases have emerged over time. So when we look at varying different factors to try to understand how climate and climate change might be impacting vector-borne diseases, they are all interrelated in multiple different contexts where you have the climate impacts on the vectors themselves, as well as the whole environmental and social context in which these diseases are happening with changing ecosystems, changing vector control practices, social determinants of health and landscape designs are all interrelated with each other. So to wrap up and conclude, there are multiple levels at which weather and climate impact vectors, pathogens, hosts, human behavior, and even vector-borne diseases as a whole. And these impacts are multifaceted and interconnected, where they're very non-linear changes on vectors and hosts, and they're all interrelated with each other, such that the relative contributions of each factor may not be easy to ascertain or tease out exactly what are the major drivers for prediction of vector-borne diseases. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the rest of this webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karen. That was excellent. Um, folks on the line, feel free to add questions in. Um, you're a little shy right now. We have no, queue, no questions in the queue, but feel free to add those as we continue. And hopefully I have uh, turned presentation rights over to Morgan. Oh, great. There's Morgan's screen. All right, let me get my slides up here. Uh, is that looking correct? Yeah, that looks great, thanks. Excellent, and am I ready to launch into it? 
Yeah, go for it, Morgan. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I was really excited that Joe and team reached out to me because I am actually a weather weenie by uh, initial training myself. So um, I started out at University of Michigan and I uh, got my bachelor's in earth system science and engineering with a concentration in meteorology. Um, and then decided that I wanted to go get my PhD. Um, I was pretty dead set on becoming an aviation meteorologist. Um, and when I looked into PhD programs, I couldn't find much that uh, suited that career path. So I ended up getting sucked into this really fascinating world of weather and climate and human health. And that's where I've landed since. So I'm going to talk about uh, one of my favorite disease systems today, and that is valley fever. So valley fever, or formerly known as coccidioidomycosis, is an infectious fungal disease that's endemic in arid and semi-arid portions of North and South America. Um, it is caused when humans or other animals breathe in the fungus coccidioides that live in these dry desert soils. About 40% of humans that breathe in the spores will actually develop symptoms. Um, so if you are not immunocompromised, um, generally you will fight it off and actually not even know you breathed it in or got sick. Um, but for that 40%, symptoms start off very similar to the flu. You'll have uh, rash, fever, chills, and the fungus can actually spread throughout your body and cause some really nasty side effects like skin lesions and unfortunately be fatal. Um, something that I find fascinating is about 200 people each year um, die from valley fever, which is more than West Nile virus. Um, even though West Nile virus is found throughout the whole United States and valley fever is really limited to the southwestern portion. Um, valley fever does not spread from human to human, so cases are a direct result from someone breathing in the fungus from the environment. And what's fascinating with the valley fever community is we've seen an increase in cases over time. So looking at the bar graph in the top right of the slide, we're looking at cases uh, in reportable states. So not all states are required to report their cases, uh, but in the states that do, um, you can you know, imagine slapping a linear trend on this and total number of cases are increasing. We had a, a change in diagnostics that happened around 2009 to 2012. So that's partially the reason why we're seeing that little blip there with um, some false positive tests. But uh, this has really captured our attention because we're wondering if this is potentially an early indicator of climate change. Um, it's hard to say for sure right now because it could be that we're getting better at diagnosing and reporting the, the disease, but um, I don't think we can fully uh, discount that yet. So coccidioides grows in the soil. I'm showing a step one here. Uh, its primary function in the soil is to act as a decomposer of animal proteins. Uh, it grows in these microscopic fungal strands and it's happy and it's growing when there's enough environmental moisture uh, available in these dry soils and there's uh, nutrients available. Then if it becomes stressed, whether that's a lack of nutrients or uh, extreme dry periods, its form of survival is to break apart into these tiny barrel shapes, uh, which we call spores, um, that are about two to five microns in length. And any type of soil disturbance is shown as step three, whether that's digging in the dirt or a high winds event can cause these spores to become aloft. And that's when humans can breathe them in and become sick. That's shown in step four. So since the fungus is growing in these soils, it's directly responsive to its surrounding uh, environmental conditions. So climate is not only modulating some of this life cycle of when coccyx is growing and when it is spreading, but it's also limiting the endemic region for this disease. So at the time of our study that I'm gonna show you today, the CDC Valley Fever Endemicity Map was based off of a skin test study um, from the 1950s. Uh, and this is a map of the results of the skin test study. So the 
uh, endemic area are the counties that are filled in in green colors where the darker counties are the highest endemic counties and that's really Kern County in uh, the San Joaquin Valley of California uh, and South Central Arizona area. I will throw in a caveat that since our study um, has been published, uh, the CDC has updated their endemicity map um, to show where Coccidioides, that fungus, is most likely to live, and that is in the solid orange color, and then the potential range um, in a kind of striped yellow color. It's a little difficult to see, so I put some gray boundaries on either side. Uh, so really, this is a disease that is primarily limited to the dry southwestern desert areas of the United States. Um, but we know our climate is changing. So for our study here, we're looking at um, a high emissions, high greenhouse gas emissions, high climate warming scenarios. So this is RCP 8.5. I'm um, looking out to uh, the end of the 21st century or 2100. Uh, temperatures, uh, mean annual temperatures in the contiguous United States are expected to increase by three to six degrees Celsius. Uh, mean annual precipitation is expected to shift uh, regionally where that endemic area in the southwestern United States might stay about the same. We might have some regional uh, increases in precip and decreases but ultimately what these changes might do is shift the geographical range of where valley fever is endemic and therefore what population is at risk for contracting this disease so uh, one of the main driving questions of my research has been where is valley fever endemic can we build upon that skin test study that was done uh, at this time over 60 60 years ago, and then estimate where might valley fever be endemic in the future. So going out and taking soil samples and actually testing for the fungus is incredibly difficult because it's quite sporadic in the environment. Uh, since it's a primarily a soil uh, decomposer, um, it can be found in one part of the soil and you can take another soil sample a meter to your right and you'll get a negative. So taking these taking these samples and, and gathering data that way uh, is not really feasible and won't give us enough kind of large scale uh, information so what we rely on is human case data so in the top uh, right hand corner corner we're looking at a map of uh, mean annual valley fever incidence so this is number of cases normalized by population do that so we can better compare some of these uh, sparsely populated counties in the in the west um and the counties in the darker red colors here have the highest incidence so these are probably our most endemic counties uh so the first part of my study was just gathering this valley fever case data from the states that were reporting cases um so i grabbed it for uh these five states in the southwest um from 2000 to 2015 the data is available uh, at the county level by month. And this included almost 150,000 cases over our time period. And just already comparing that to the historical CDC endemicity map, uh, we found some slight differences where our map may have shown that uh, Valley Fever is more endemic further north in the Central Valley of California um, and some other some other um, places further north than depicted by the, the CDC. And so I was wondering if we can, can we look at these highest endemic counties and the climate conditions in these counties and gain any, any information about what is structuring this area of endemicity. Uh, so what I'm showing here are two scattered graphs. We're looking at mean annual temperature um, plotted on the x-axis on the left-hand side against uh, mean annual valley fever incidence on the y-axis. And then on the right-hand side in blue, we're looking at mean annual precipitation on the x-axis and mean annual valley fever on the y-axis, where each one of these dots on the scatter graph is one of the counties uh, in those five southwestern states that I just showed. 
So checking these scatter graphs out, there's you know some clear nonlinear relationships between these climate drivers and valley fever incidence. So there's a nonlinear positive relationship between temperature and incidence, um, and a nonlinear negative relationship between precipitation and incidence. So essentially, the hotter and the drier counties tend to have the highest incidence. Um, and this is describing that desert area that we know is endemic for valley fever. And when I looked a little closer and ended up defining a, a county endemicity threshold saying, okay, I'll, I'll consider a county endemic for valley fever if they have at least 10 cases per 100,000 population per year incidence. I found that each one of those counties had mean annual temperature greater than 10.7 degrees Celsius and mean annual precipitation less than 600 millimeters per year. And so this gave me information where if I wanted to uh, potentially go out and, and maybe identify a county that could be endemic for valley fever that we you know, might not be counting a lot of our cases at or might not have taken soil samples at, um, it could indicate uh, you know, other areas endemic for this disease. So I took that information and I ended up plotting it out in geographical space. So the counties here on the map plotted in red are all of those that meet our mean annual temperature threshold of 10.7 degrees Celsius, um, averaged from 2000 to 2015. So much of the southern half of the United States. And I did the same thing for mean annual precipitation. So all the counties uh, mapped in blue here, much of the western half of the United States, meet our mean annual precipitation threshold of having less than 600 uh, millimeters per year. And then if I overlay those two maps on top of each other, I get this area highlighted in magenta in the southwestern United States. And based on those simple relationships between valley fever incidents and climate drivers, this is the area that I would expect to be potentially endemic for valley fever. Uh, overall, this area in magenta encompasses uh, 217 counties across 12 different states, and um, at the time included a population of almost uh, 52 million people living in this area. So I'm gonna grab that magenta area that was highlighted, pull it over to the next map on the top uh, right-hand side, and compare it to the CDC historical endemicity map. And there are some clear differences between these two maps. Um, our estimate of valley fever endemicity extends further north uh, than the CDC map, especially through the central plains, um, the central valley of California. There's also a couple counties that are plotted as potentially endemic uh, further north than Utah and Idaho. And what was fascinating to me is, are these three counties in southeastern Washington state that are highlighted in our map. Now, from this historical skin test study, the CDC actually did not include those in the map. Um, they were later added on after a 2013 study was published when someone fell off their ATV in this area and ended up contracting valley fever. And the CDC and the Washington State Department of Health teamed up and they went out and they sampled the soils and ended up finding coccidioides there. So the CDC added on those three counties to the map. And our really simple climate constrained endemicity map using just the mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation also pulled those counties out. So it gave me confidence that our simple model uh, could be a great estimate for where valley fever is endemic. So the next question following this will, was where, if we could if we could identify where valley fever is endemic now, well then let's use climate projections to estimate where valley fever might be endemic in the future. So again, this is for RCP 8.5 um, climate scenario, and we're plotting again in magenta the counties that meet both of those uh, climate threshold requirements. And we see uh, throughout the 21st century, the area endemic to valley fever expands from the southwestern United States 
all the way up to the US Canadian border by year 2100. Uh, the area of endemicity is, is limited. It doesn't expand into the cold Rockies or the more uh, wet Pacific Northwest coast. And then it follows uh, the eastern extent of, of the endemic area really follows the almost a dry line region, um, separating that dry uh, desert air that comes out of the Four Corners region um, and where that meets the warmer moist air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. So it's kind of just traveling right along that 100th meridian. So what was once a disease of the southwestern United States by the end of the 21st century might actually become a disease of the western United States, primarily driven by the county's warming in temperature and already being quite dry. Um, so from our study, we found that valley fever um, is probably endemic further north than previously thought. And then throughout the 21st century in response to that high greenhouse gas emissions, high climate warming scenario, uh, valley fever might be endemic to much of the Western United States. Uh, we expect a over 50% increase in the number of, of endemic counties. And in turn, this will cause a lot more people to be at risk for this disease. Um, so we're hoping that this information can really be used by the state uh, health agencies so that disease surveillance programs can be put in place um, and we can stay one step ahead of, of this disease and prevent some of the negative health outcomes. So thank you so much for including me today. Um, I appreciate it and I'm happy to take any questions. My email's on this slide as well. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. That was excellent. Um, we haven't gotten any questions for you yet, but I encourage people to put them in. We did get one for Karen, but I think we're going to save that until our Q&A at the end uh, and just kind of keep things going through our speaker list. So, Joe, I'm going to give you panelist control and hopefully you can share your screen. Oh, it looks great. Excellent. Well, thanks, Joe. Um, so, my name is also Joe. Uh, I'm Joe Krieger. Um, I'm NOAA's Invasive Species Program Coordinator. I'm with uh, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and focus on invasive species, which have certainly been shown to have tremendous impacts on both animal and human health, as well as um, potentially devastating impacts on environments in which receive them, um, all of which in some cases have been shown to be exacerbated uh, by climate change. And so this part of the, the uh, presentation, we're just gonna, we're gonna break this into two. I'm just gonna give kind of a, an overview of NOAA's um, congressional and executive mandates around invasive species. Really the, the why is NOAA involved with invasive species management? And then I'm gonna kick it over to um, Dr. Sean McDonald, who's gonna narrow in on a particular aspect or a particular invasive species that's gaining quite a bit of political and public attention right now. Uh, so first, just highlighting um, the National Invasive Species Council. This is a, a White House level national group that was born out of a, a couple of executive um, orders during the Clinton administration. Um, NOAA is designated as one of the three co-chair entities, along with the Department of the Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, our representative on this group is Janie Babishi, who's the Deputy Administrator of NOAA and also the Undersecretary of Ocean and Atmosphere. Uh, this group's comprised of 12 different federal agencies and, and four executive offices of the President. And really, its, it's um, uh, motivation or, or, or goal is to establish a national coordinated framework around addressing issues with both terrestrial and aquatic invasive species. Uh, the next group is the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, and this was born out of an act of Congress through the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Nuisance Species Prevention and Control Act of 1990. Um, and in that, NOAA was mandated uh, or delegated to be one of the two co-chair agencies along with the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There are 13 federal partners, but any agency that has some interest in invasive species management is welcome to join. We also have 13 ex officio members. Um, and whereas the, the NISC is, is more of a, a high, high ranging framework development um, uh, group, this is more focused on boots on the ground management. So actually having resource managers 
in the field implementing these different invasive species strategies. Uh, so they, they foster cooperation and collaboration between federal, state, and local partners, as well as tribal entities and, and members of, of the public. Um, and just looking at kind of a regional perspective, underneath the, the national um, task force, there are six different region regional groups. And you can see there's uh, even one in the Western area. Um, and so they, these are groups that get their um, instructions from the national level group to implement regional management plans uh, for invasive species. And then finally, just to give you a, a taste of some of the, the wide-ranging invasive species projects that the, that the agency is involved in. Um, we have things like stony coral tissue loss disease, which is running rampant through the, the Pacific, or the, the um, excuse me, the Atlantic and the Caribbean right now, causing a lot of damage to coral reefs. And there's a really strong fear that this is going to make it into the Pacific. It's been shown to be able to be transferred with ballast water. Um, and so there's a lot of um, concern with that. Um, we also have uh, lionfish that we're working with. Some of you may have, may have heard about that. Um, those down, down in the, the Caribbean, they're venomous, they're voracious. They, they, really, eat, they really go after uh, local and uh, native reef fishes and have caused the, the collapse of several coral reef systems that depend on these fishes. And so NOAA Sanctuaries is really involved with that. Um, and in so both of these cases, there's, there's this um, really um, big concern about regional impacts on areas that rely on coral reefs for tourism and, and other economies. Um, there's also, uh, looking at the Great Lakes, we have issues with quagga and zebra mussels, which um, is a big concern for folks uh, out in the West because they're they're moving on boats that people are taking out of the Great Lakes and driving them across the country and becoming established in in different river systems um, out in the West and and these things do a lot of a lot of damage in a variety of ways. Well, the big one is that they're encrusting, so they they clog the intake pipes of cities that are on bodies of water, uh, which is very expensive to repair and remove. Uh, so there's a big concern with that. Um, and then a recent it incident that popped up, um, for those of you in Seattle you might be familiar with this, but uh, a year or two ago, uh, an aquarist in, uh, in Seattle found a, an inside of a moss ball, so this, this ball of moss that Aquarius put into their aquariums to establish an algal colony, um, there was a little zebra mussel inside of it. And so this triggered uh, a lot of uh, alarms um, looking at how do we monitor for invasive species coming in um, internationally, so uh, at ports of entry, um, and this has launched a very big uh, interagency collaborative effort to, to look at that. Um, so this is just kind of a, a taste of, of, of some of the work that, that NOAA does with invasive species, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but I'm going to turn the rest of our presentation over to Sean so he can talk about um, European green crab. Thank you so much, Joe. Hopefully everybody can hear me and I'm gonna just try to get through, oh, get through this as best and as quickly as I can. You can see my screen, I hope, and the presentation. All right, then I'm gonna just close this up so I can get moving. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, for having me to talk about the European green crab. Joe uh, teed me up nicely uh, to talk about this particular species that I've been spending a lot of time working on for about the last 25 years. So uh, before I go too much further, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge uh, my colleagues, CRAB team, which is a program of the Washington Sea Grant was developed to provide support for early detection and monitoring of green crab invasion in Washington state through a network of nearly 70 stations that are run by citizen scientists and partners. We also provide scientific guidance for the lead management agency in our state, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I know what you're thinking, you're looking at this picture and you're seeing me right in the middle and you're thinking that I must be pretty important. No, actually it's just alphabetical. And I just happen to be right there in the, in the center. Um, so um, my, the species of interest here, the target of this effort is the European green crab or the European short crab, Carcinus manus. It's a medium sized brachyurian crab with adults getting really no bigger than your fist. Uh, yet they uh, are they are uh, a globally successive inv successful invasive species with a long history of producing local impacts, or I should say, localized impacts. Uh, from their native range in the Northeast Atlantic, green crabs have established populations worldwide. 
Uh, and a number of these are primary invasions coming uh, directly from the native range, but also there's genetic evidence that supports that some of these are secondary invasions with spread resulting from invaded sites. And that's uh, most clear when we see the invasion of Atlantic Panagonia, which uh, came from Australia and New Zealand, and uh, the invasion of the US West Coast, which uh, came from the US East Coast. So the species has been successful uh, really because it possesses a variety of characteristics known to facilitate invasions in the marine environment. And I don't really have time to get into all of those today in this presentation, but for the purposes of today's theme, I just want to highlight two of these. That's that green crabs are extremely tolerant of a wide range of physical conditions, including extremes in temperature, extremes in salinity, pH, and even desiccation. And it's this host of characteristics that's allowed green crabs to become abundant in many of the invaded regions that it's spread to. And, and, and truly it is by virtue of their often extreme abundance that green crabs have produced some of their best documented localized impacts within invaded regions. To be clear, not all of these, region, these impacts have been observed in every region. Uh, and so I'm just sort of highlighting in this cartoon some of those impacts that, that have been observed and what we are most concerned about here on the U.S. West Coast. So along the West Coast, um, we're concerned with things like declines in shellfish resources due to predation, uh, as well as declines in eelgrass beds due to herbivory, mechanical disturbance, and seed predation. Uh, green crabs also interact with native crabs, including commercially valuable Dungeness crab, as well as non-commercial species, but ecologically important ones like uh, native shore crabs. Uh, and of course, in our highly connected ecosystems, no impacts are in isolation. So these primary impacts can ripple out and reduce resources for things like migratory shorebirds, salmon, and other species. And ultimately, uh, this can impact uh, us as humans who rely on these ecosystems as well. So as this cartoon depicts, uh, this could potentially lead to really massive changes in our near shore ecosystems that have been infested by green crabs, where green crabs become extremely abundant. As a relatively recent invasion, the history of and spread, the history of the spread of European green crabs along the US West Coast has been very well documented and described. So I'm just going to step you through that very quickly. Um, so uh, while they got to this coast by human transport across land, um, they have subsequently spread pretty dramatically through uh, larval processes, so larvae in the coastal ocean that are facilitated by warm climactic events. So in particular, these events include El Nino, uh, which have produced the largest range expansions because of warm conditions, uh, accompanied by increased northward transport in the Davidson Current along the coast, uh, primarily during the winter time. So we can just kind of step through these very quickly so you can see that I should also point out that uh, that marine heat waves, such as the blob, the, the most famous of the marine heat waves from 2014, 2016, also contributes to some degree as well. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So first established in California, spreading up the coast, primarily the, the largest range expansion was 97, 98 during that large El Nino at that time. Uh, subsequent years, up into 2010, they spread to the northern part of Vancouver Island um, and the central British Columbia coast. Uh, and then um, in 2020, they made it all the way to Prince Rupert uh, and the doorstep of Alaska. And then finally, in 2022, they were uh, collected, green crab were collected in, um, in Alaska for the first time. So uh, that's really how warming conditions have impacted range expansion coastwide, so the northward expansion of green crabs along our coast. So now I'm going to transition and really just speak about how these conditions impact management at more of a regional level. And here I'm going to focus on two locations, Willapa Bay, which is on Washington's outer coast, and the inland waters of the Salish Sea. So thanks to work by Sylvia Yamada at Oregon State University, we have a really good record 
of the recruitment of green crabs in Willapa Bay since the start of the invasion, as you can see here. Uh, and we're using capture rate in 100 traps as a proxy for relative abundance in this case. So we can see uh, if we overlay some uh, some little arrows here, we can see a pretty clear signature of El Nino across this time period. Whenever we've had El Nino events along the coast, we've seen recruitment of green crab into Willapa Bay, but that has been very pulsed. Um, with uh, with pulses occurring at, at intervals in this case. However, it wasn't really until 2015, 2016 that we saw major increases. And these corresponded to marine heat waves in the Northeastern Pacific. So the first one being the blob and then subsequent events in 2019, 20, and 21. So it's a, it's a fairly clear connection or, or at least a correlation there. Um, Capture rates in the inland waters of the Salish Sea are a little bit different, but we still see the same signature of warm conditions. Uh, first though, a little history. Uh, back in 2012, the, uh, there was a green crab infestation identified from Souk Basin on Vancouver Island after an accidental human introduction. And this was the first established population within the Salish Sea. Uh, and subsequently, crab team was formed in response in order to monitor any spread into Washington waters and assist in removal efforts as needed. And it's because of the crab team network that we feel confident green crabs didn't arrive in inland waters of the Salish Sea any earlier. Um, I also want to point out here on the map um, the, uh, the really startling increase that we see between 20, 2020 and 2021 is, is really honestly due to a single site as the artificial lagoon known as the Lummi Sea Pond. And when we take out the Lummi Sea Pond data from the, from the inland uh, capture records, uh, we see that the catch within the Salish Sea is really only a fraction of what we observed out in Willapa Bay. And in fact, we have to rescale our axis by a couple orders of magnitude in order to see the pattern. And again, um, I've overlaid uh, warming events on this graphic. At this point, however, you probably are wondering why green crabs are relatively less abundant in the inland waters as compared with the outer coast. And we believe this is partly due to the oceanography of our region and the substantial management effort that's being expended here. So first, the oceanography. Uh, coastal currents move green crab larvae up and down the coast, and these movements uh, are primarily northward during the winter uh, because of the, the Davidson current along our coast. Um, and then in the summer, we have the spring transition uh, within the California current system, which brings larvae down from the west coast of Vancouver Island. So that means that the outer coast of uh, Washington State, in a place typified by Willapa Bay, receives larval input during a large portion of the year. Uh, but what about the Salish Sea? So it turns out that the Strait of Juan de Fuca is actually a semi-permeable barrier uh, to um, a semi-permeable barrier into the Salish Sea because of surface flow that is outward through much of the year. Uh, however, we do see some periodic reversals that often occur because of storms. Thus, the Salish Sea is protected relative to the outer coast uh, embayments, and this protection. Uh, has given managers a little bit of breathing room to undertake removal efforts in places like Dungeness Bay and Drayton Harbor, which I've shown here on the map now. At both of these sites, green crabs were detected really early through the crab team network, and then partners subsequently undertook really massive removal efforts to eliminate as many green crabs as possible. And, and these efforts um, are ongoing, but we've seen dramatic declines in captures associated with the removal efforts at these sites. So these experiences give us uh, some hope that we can limit the spread of green crab in the Salish Sea and stave off these impacts. But not notably, uh, and particularly in this last year, we were benefited by some extremely cold conditions in our region. Um, so what does the future hold? Uh, according to the IPCC, we can expect an increase in the frequency of extreme El Nino events from about one every 20 years to about one every 10 years by the end of the 21st century. 
which likely means greater coastwide spread of green crab. We also know that marine heat waves have become about 50% more frequent over the past decade. And recent oceanographic modeling by our colleagues at Woods Hole suggests that even relatively minor increases in wintertime temperatures can dramatically increase the probability of successful invasion into the Eastern Salish Sea. So uh, I'll just close by saying that there's a lot of reason for concern. Uh, currently, management efforts are focused on increasing capacity to do the, the monitoring and removal. Uh, and we'll continue to do that as we prepare for next year, which, by the way, is predicted to be another El Nino event. So with that, I will just say thank you for your time. Um, and I will uh, just indicate that if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Crab Team, you can check out our website and you can certainly contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Sean, and thanks, Joe. Um, these are all excellent presentations and I really appreciate um, all the speakers really pulling on the climate thread in, in kind of explaining um, kind of what's happened with uh, these different organisms, as well as their um, exceptional ability to speak through diagrams. I think this is really helpful, especially someone with, uh, with less health background. So we did get a couple questions to come in. And um, I'm hoping I can get um, uh, Karen and Morgan to, to hop back on the audio at least. So the first one is for Karen. And um, the question is, uh, was the prevalence or sustain survivability of the Lyme disease causing bacteria itself looked at during the tick distribution studies that you showed? Uh, no, none of the figures that I was showing and the thread I was pulling had anything to do with how Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen itself, is impacted by temperatures and precipitation regimes. Overall, at warmer temperatures, there's the potential for faster um, transmission. However, the ticks themselves only generally take one bite per life stage. So having that multiple year life stage, we're gonna have a slower impact to potentially transmission overall. Excellent, thanks, Karen. Um, and Morgan, there are two questions about Washington State for you. So one is um, kind of why is the fungus uh, causing valley fever found only in those three counties in kind of southeastern Washington with, with no connection to to the other nearby counties? That's the first question. And then the second one is about the west side of the Cascades and kind of whether projected changes in uh, temperature uh, and potentially precipitation, uh, especially during the growing season, would, would those changes make uh, kind of the west side of Washington state possibly uh, susceptible for, for the valley fever fungus? Yeah, great question. So, um, the more I've dug into this question about where valley fever may be endemic in the Pacific Northwest, the more I've realized that I think we need to go out and look a little bit harder. Um, I actually don't think it's limited to just those three counties. Um, that is what that simple climate constrained niche model picked up. But when I actually uh, look at the like native gridded resolution of the climate data, which is four kilometers uh, grid spacing, uh, it does pick up some endemic areas in other counties. Uh, when I take those climate averages over the county level, I'm getting a lot of heterogeneity in the you know mountainous areas and the more drylands areas, so it's kind of averaging out. So I do expect it to be uh, endemic in neighboring areas that are also hot and dry um, and potentially over the Oregon border too. On the west side of the state, I think it's gonna remain too wet. So this fungus is really a desert fungus. It does not do well competing with other soil microbes. Um, so it will not be able to uh, survive and sustain itself um, where, when it's too wet. So I think it'll not, not become endemic in the Western uh, Washington state. Great, thank you, Morgan. Um, and then I've got one question on um, 
green crabs for, for Sean. Um, are the green crabs vulnerable to ocean acidification, either in larval stages or the adult stage? Oh, Sean, I think you're on mute. Always gets me. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, there actually has been a, quite a bit of work done on European green crab because they are essentially like the lab rat of the ocean. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work done, um, you know, some basic science work and, and uh, physiology of this critter um, in many different places. The general information that I've seen, at least in the adult form, is that uh, they are less susceptible than many of our native species here on the West Coast. So they are fairly tolerant of um, relatively low partial pressures uh, and the like. In terms of uh, information about their larval development, we don't actually have a lot of information there, but at least in the juvenile and adult forms, we expect that they're pretty resilient. Great, thank you, Sean. Well, I'm gonna wrap things up. We did get a couple more questions. I'll share them with our speakers and if they um, have have time to, to provide answers, they, they can share that uh, if, uh, if their schedule allows. But I wanna thank everybody for being on the line for this. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this will be posted at uh, noaa.west uh, noaa.gov slash westwatch if you want to uh, take another viewing or share with colleagues. Uh, and thanks again to all the speakers who did an excellent job. Uh, for everyone, have a great rest of your week and we'll catch you next month.